I'm Kimberly C. Palm. As I travel throughout each state, I realize that death is just a moment. It is how we live until that moment that matters. Finding connection with friends, family, and complete strangers. Journey with me. This is the Live Well, Die Well Tour. Well, Phyllis, thank you so much for rejoining the podcast. You're about one of three people that I've had back onto the podcast because things keep developing and new things are happening with you. And that's what's so exciting to bring people uh, from the first season back on. So welcome back to Death by Design podcast. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you again for inviting me again. So I guess we need to recap for some of our present day listeners a little bit about your story, about your husband. You know, what is this VSED? Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there because I think it's really important to recap a little bit about how we connected and why we're talking about your late husband. Okay. Let me tell you that VSED stands for Voluntary Stopping Eating and Drinking. It's nothing new. We all know that at the end of life, people naturally lose their desire to eat and drink. This is a little different because this is a proactive decision to stop eating and drinking so you can intentionally end your life and reduce and eliminate suffering. And my husband uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and also laryngeal cancer, but he, by miraculous and uh, extraordinary care. Um, He actually healed from the laryngeal cancer, but like his mother who died from Alzheimer's and like his father who had dementia, his, the Alzheimer's got worse. And we knew we had a limited amount of time where he could still make a decision for himself about what he wanted to do. And he picked a date and he decided to voluntarily stop eating and drinking So he did not want to live into the late stages of Alzheimer's. And it is my kind of educated guess that a big reason why VSED is used today and will continue to be used more and more is because Alzheimer's is the fastest growing disease. And also it does not qualify for the Death with Dignity Act in Mm. those states that it exists. That's very true. That's very true. But your husband had the the conscious wherewithal to make this decision for himself. Correct. And, um, you know, there's mental competency and there's mental capacity. And um, our elder care attorney, I asked her one day, I said, how did you know that Alan was mentally competent enough to make this decision so that you would feel comfortable representing us and helping us with the documents and so forth. And she said, and she was so right because I witnessed this. She says, I just talked to him and he understood every question I asked him and he was able to answer all of my questions. So I felt comfortable moving forward. Oh, wow. That's, you know, it's so important to make these types of plans, but sometimes you don't know what you don't know until you're into what you're surrounded with. Absolutely. And I really paved the way for many other people. Um, I didn't know anybody, not one person that really knew, had gone through with a loved one, this process. And so I had to, um, I had to create the wheel, really. Mm. And um, I found the right professionals. I came up against a lot of roadblocks, but this was very important to Alan. And I told him I would support him in whatever decision that he made. And this is what he wanted to do. And now, you know, it's nice that I am back talking with you again today, Kimberly, because a lot has happened in the field of VSED. And just in the last year, I've been part of the advisory council for the national organization, Compassion and Choices. They have developed an extraordinary online tool called the Dementia Decoder, so that when somebody is mentally competent, and we could do this now even for ourselves, we can go on and we can put into our um, health directives, you know, what our decisions are if down the road we've got any kind of dementia. 
And also, um, I just recently had a wonderful and long conversation with the um, new uh, executive director at End of Life Washington. Her name is Judy Kinney. And um, I would say the biggest thrust for End of Life Washington this year is not only to continue with the death with dignity law, but it's to support people um, through VSED. And this is extraordinary. And it's like, I think a dream come true for Alan and myself. Sure. You know, it must have been so hard to figure this out as you walked by the side of your husband, trying to support him in his decision. And and since Alan's death, everything, you are paving the way. You're a pioneer because now you're really bringing this to the forefront. Um, And what I love about VSED is that it is the right of the patient. Um, no one can stop them by or force them. Um, this is their, their I, well, I guess I, I mean, I guess somebody could force them to eat and have hydration, but it, it, I love that it comes from the patient's decision and action as well. Have you heard of anyone sort of, what are the complications with, you know, VSED? Well, the complications would occur in that if a person was in some kind of a uh, nursing home, I, I've i never yet heard of a nursing home that allowed it, number one. Oh, wow. um, okay. And I suppose if you were in a hospital and you were not conscious, I mean, that's a whole nother ball game, you know. Where sure. You, but that's a whole nother situation. But everybody has the inherent right and choice about eating and drinking. So all of the situations that I've heard of about VSED have happened in someone's private home. I mean, just recently, I do consult with people about this and people contact me and I have this website and people often initially contact me through my website. And recently I did some consulting with a woman whose mother has subsequently passed and her mother was in a uh, uh, some kind of a facility and they took her out of the facility and brought her home and hired the proper care and her mom had a good death. Oh, wow. That's... That's amazing. So how how long has it been since Alan passed away? Seven and a half years. Wow. So you this is you've seen some definite forward advances in this whole movement. I have, and mostly I would say in the last couple of years. I didn't for quite a while. Other than that, I kept hearing about more cases and people contacted me. And I saw that death doulas were getting trained to do this, you know, more with with people and to facilitate this. But in the last couple of years, now it's being faced um, really head on. And I, I think it has to do largely with the awareness about what little choice we have in the face of dementia and, you know, my, my chronological peers, um, want to have choice. Absolutely. Thank you for paving the way for even my generation, because the more choices I think we have at end of life, the better we're able to serve people where they're at. Um, and that's, you know, the thing is you don't want to get into a, a serious illness and one and wish you had something or were aware of something. So I really do appreciate all your hard work. Now, seven years in, how's the grief work going? You know, I was just talking to Hope Edelman uh, and she has a new book out called After Grief, that grief doesn't ever leave you. Um, But talk to me a little bit about your process. Okay, I will. And I think it's such an important process to talk about um, because it can put, sharing this can put other people at ease because being in a deep grieving process, which I would say, lasted for about three years for me. The first year was the most intense and then it began to ease up a little bit. But uh, that first year, um, I almost felt like I was an animal Hmm. and just dealing with primal instinct. I mean, literally there were days where I just found myself on the floor. I didn't even know I got there on the floor sobbing. And I made the decision ahead of time. I knew enough about grief to know that the only way out of the grief was to go through it. Otherwise, I was just going to be a prisoner of my own grief. And so I did the work. I did the hard work. I I spent most of my time by myself that first year. 
Um, it's very interesting as I look back, there were not many people who really reached out to me when I think about neighbors and friends in that way. And I think people are so uncomfortable being around someone who is in that phase of grief. And I was okay with it. I just, I just went with what I had to. I felt Alan's presence mm. quite a bit. I felt I was having my own form of communication with him. He's still very present to me. Uh, sometimes more than others. So because I had this actually conscious intellectual thought and understanding that the only way out was to go through, that's what I did. And by about the third year, after about three years, I began to really kind of come out of myself. I began to socialize more. I began to go to art workshops. I went to a wonderful singing workshop. And, you know, I like workshops. I'm kind of a workshop junkie. I love, <laughs> I love it. I mean, I like learning. I like art. I like music. And um, I began to get to be around other people. And I would say the biggest part of my moving through my grief was the work I was doing to educate others. So the first thing I did was two years after, well, I began to speak right away, my TEDx talk. I was on the stage of my TEDx talk only seven months after Alan died. Oh. And I'm pretty raw. When you watch that talk, I mean, I was raw. On, yeah. the, on that stage. I'm going to have to go back and like watch it just to know that it's only seven months from Alan's death. Yeah. I mean, and I, I learned about it, uh, I think three months after he died and I applied. But it's interesting. The people who interviewed me and picked me said that my topic of all the people who had applied, a hundred people had applied. And I don't know, 15 of us got chosen. I don't remember. But um, they said, your talk, is the most selfless of oh, any wow. of the people we interviewed. And so I just, you know, shared our, our story. And then two years uh, later, uh, I realized I was going to fulfill Alan's wish when he said to me two weeks before he started the process, when he turned to me with tears in his eyes and said, I want everyone to know about VSED. And I spontaneously replied, you'll just have to trust that I'll be your vehicle. I didn't even oh, know wow. what I was, I didn't even know what I was saying. And it was, so it was more all from my heart. This wasn't mm. from my head. This all came from my heart. And I felt I would be making a huge contribution and hopefully heal some in the process, which I did by sharing the story with others. So I wrote the website. It's still up. Um, I think about 85,000 people, you know, or so have looked at it. And oh, wow, uh, that's a lot of people, you know, yeah. to, to learn about it. So I did the website and then with some encouragements with some friends who did some brainstorming with me, I decided to write the book and I felt that that's where I could really get the most information out. And it went, it, it flowed, it went nicely. The book's called Choosing to Die and it's available on Amazon. And it was important that I wrote the book. I have a wonderful sister-in-law, Susan Page, who's written about six books. And so she was my first editor and she was there by my side, helping me really every step of the way. And it made it possible for me to do what seemed like a huge, humongous task. Well, you know, it is, you are the teacher and isn't it, isn't it interesting that Alan's death and process has now become your mission yeah. and it, it stemmed from a personal, a personal experience. And that to me, in, in the way you tell the story, it, it, it combines that you, you were in the dark and you had to figure it out as you went. And you thought that not, nobody should have to do that. And you've become, you have become this vehicle in this yes. sort of category, helping people address, especially the dementia, where you tend to have no legal rights um, or, or take advantage of the compassion and choices um, because of not having that cognitive ability. Um, so I, I know you've got some exciting news. Uh, I, I talked to a few people and, and they told me you must get back in, in touch with uh, Phyllis because there, there's this thing that you're even taking it to a whole nother level in a way that it's very artful as well. So talk to us a little bit about what's happening with your book. 
Okay, well, thank you. Um, I would say there are two areas where I'm taking my life to another level. The first one is that, you know, I've done a lot of public speaking over these last seven years. And about two years ago, I was invited to be a speaker at what was at the time an annual authors festival at Seattle University. And in the audience listening to me that day was a man who came up to me afterward. And we met and he bought my book. And, and a couple of days later, he contacted me and said, I am in contact with a film producer that I'd like to introduce you to. And I'd like to arrange for the three of us to have um, a phone conversation. And a few days later, we all connected on, on the phone. And as it turned out, um, this man, Norman Stevens, um, has been a successful film producer for his entire career. He's in his 70s now and close to retirement. And um, he had actually received a request prior to our conversation for another film from someone who was interested in produce and in um, I would say investing in um, another film about Alzheimer's. And so he really went to work with this project and we, you know, I filled out the proper legal documents and so forth. And he hired somebody to write a screenplay and the film is called Last Dance. Mm. And he did find the funding for the film and then COVID happened. And so we have not been able to move forward, but I stay in touch with him. And he promises me that his enthusiasm is as keen and we will move forward. And I believe we will hopefully sometime next year. Hope we can you know, move forward with the process. And if anything, the timing is even better because these large organizations now are really so supportive you know, a VSED. So that's a really big thing. And I put a lot, I've put a lot of energy um, with the um, assistant director who's done a lot of research. And I've had many, many long conversations with him, had some long conversations with the screenplay writer. And it will be a beautiful love story. Mm. And the whole, then the true ending and the real love story will be told, including how Alan died and There'll be, you know, of course, that death scene. And um, so I think this is actually our best opportunity for people to learn about VSED, hopefully all over the world. I mean, it will be online, hopefully in theaters too. And we'll see. I I love it because I see so many scripts and movies coming out that are addressing end-of-life issues, but nothing when it comes to VSED. And I love that this is being incorporated. And, and you do love art, but this is a great way, a great venue to introduce to millions of people about Alan's choice and, and how he made that choice and how you supported him. I, 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 th- I think it's awesome. And I can't wait. Um, and you know, with all this pandemic stuff, it, it does seem very timely now, doesn't it? Ah, that's interesting. It does because, you know, it's like death is in everyone's face. The fear of death, the fear of death or an illness. I mean, it's more upfront with so many people now all over the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so we're hoping for 2021 for this whole movie production to happen. And then you're thinking about another year. It could be in theaters around even worldwide. Yeah. I mean, I don't know enough about the movie making process to know if it'll <laughs> actually be in the theaters next year or the following year, but I hope so. And we keep talking the talk. I mean, the producer, I was just really just in touch with him a couple of days ago and he has assured me he is as on board um, as he ever has been with this. And for him, this is his legacy project. This is so meaningful for him. He has said over and over, this is the legacy I'm going to be leaving behind. That is amazing, uh, especially to have someone that passionate drive, you know, hire someone to write write it based on your book and, and get the funding. It just seems like the dominoes are just falling exactly the way they're supposed to. I think so. And I, you know, I have no regrets, actually. I think things, when we don't get in the way ourselves, um, get in our own way, uh, things kind of fall the way they need to. And I've had the last, well, since all this has slowed down with the film, I actually met somebody. I met a man. (gasps) And I'm in a relationship with a very loving man. Are you serious? Yes. 
Actually, it is start. It happened two years ago. It's quite significant that you're talking to me right now because I'm in the middle of this very exciting and also somewhat chaotic time yeah. because he's moving into my house in a week. Oh, oh wow! This is amazing. I know, and something I didn't really expect. And he's so on board with my story. I can talk about Alan in the film whenever I need to, and. And um, I, I believe it or not, I met him online and it was a very kind of disgusting process to have to be involved in, but I chose to be involved in it. And I was very, very close to saying, I just can't do this anymore. And um, I met him and it was, you know, took off like, just took off like wildfire. Wow. And now in, in he's, cause you live in Washington. Is it Seattle yeah. you live? I live in Bellingham, Washington, and he lives in Gig Harbor, and he is actually going to be leaving his home that he has lived in for many, many years and renting it out and moving up here. I, I, I don't know what it would have been like if we met when we were younger, but it really he it's about a three and a half hour trip to go to his house and the back and forth and the, you know, sure. packing your stuff and going and coming and not really living in either place. It just became uh, really burdensome. Sure, sure. And so we just began to talk about it. And um, he was really very much willing to make this change in his life. It's a beautiful opportunity for him, too. He's just a couple of years younger than me. So we're both in our 70s. You know, it, that makes me so happy to hear <laughs> that that the heart does grow. And it, yeah. it, we're not born to be alone in this world. And yeah. it's so beautiful to hear. I'm so excited for you. Thank you. And um, I think it's an important piece of my story. You know? Sure. I mean, really, what is the purpose of my life? It's about love, but love mm. in all its forms. It's not just about telling about Alan's and my love. I mean, it's about love and loving people and, and you know, making a contribution in, in this way. And I'm very thrilled and tremendously grateful that this man has come into my life. I am so thrilled for you. And I can't wait to hear how everything goes. And you know what? Moving through this, your grief and your life with Alan, I think when you move through it and you open your heart, you know, open it back up to love again, yeah. good things happen. Amazing things happen. And I just wish you the best of luck with the film. Are you going to try to be on set? When they film well, it? Well, I've asked. It was funny, kidding on the score. You know, when I was a little girl, like a lot of little girls, I wanted to be an actress, you know. And I said, could I, you know, can can I play myself in the film? <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. But um, maybe they'll give me a cameo, which means, you know, I can be like sitting in a restaurant or something. That would something be like. fabulous. Uh, I, I, think it. I think they will let me. Um, I don't know how this is all going to pan out in the film sure. You know, a lot of movies are now made in Vancouver, Washington. Right. I mean, uh, Canada. Vancouver, right. Canada. And I'm right next door in Bellingham. So I think there's a good chance that I'll get to be on the set. I hope That's so. That's amazing. Well, you just know we're, we're supporting you and whatever we can do to move the project further, um, please keep in touch. Uh, send me when this happens. You can send me some pictures on the set and we can already get the word out and and hopefully in, in the next couple of years, we'll see the last dance. And I'm Wonderful. just so thrilled for you, really thrilled. And I, I'm so glad you have someone new in your life. Thank you. It's, it's a blessing. Yeah. So, and, I, you know, going back to the beginning of this conversation, I don't think all of this would have evolved if I had gotten stuck in my own sadness. Hmm. I think that I was able to continue loving Alan but I was able to move through the grief. It's almost like there's a prescription. I have a close friend whose husband died about, I don't know, three or four years ago. And I've watched her process. And I think that if people, if we allow ourselves to be true to our own nature, there's almost a prescription for grieving. And if we go through it, we can come out of it in, 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 and begin to live life uh, fully again. I totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. Phyllis, thank you so much for coming back on to this podcast. Uh, you were part of the the uh, first year. And so it's so nice to hear what's going on in your life um, as we enter into our fourth season um, with Death by Design podcast. So 
bless you and we'll be thinking about you and I've got my fingers crossed that that you'll be uh, on that set soon as watching your now mission. Um, <laughs> thank you. I so yeah, I so appreciate your support and thank you, Kimberly, for inviting me back again. It really means a lot. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, you're the designer. This podcast is produced by Jason Andre with Seven Season Films. If you're interested in telling your story via podcast, look him up. You can find him at sevenseasonfilms.com.